Hi, this is Mark, and you're listening to episode two of Nerdology. I'm really pleased to be joined today by one of my podcasting heroes, it's Eric Stadney. <laughs> Hello, hi, a hero, oh my god. Uh, that's, that's a lot to live up to. I am not the deified Augustus. You can't, uh, can't speak to me in such terms. But I'm, ve- I'm very happy to be on. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be on. Thank you. Um, for those who may not know, I can't think of anyone who wouldn't know you, but uh, just let everyone know what your podcast is. Sure. I'm the co-host of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Um, uh, we've been going for um, 14 months now, I guess now, and each month we review a different of the the novels the, that uh, were written in the Doctor Who universe between the end of the classic series and the beginning of the new series. Um and I do that with my uh, co-host, Sean Homerig, who is also the co-host of The Tardis Tavern, which is a very different but equally fun Doctor Who podcast. Um, and you may also have heard me on random and assorted other Doctor Who podcasts because we're one giant cluster of people that all kind of know <laughs> each other and talk. So, yeah. I think podcast is the phrase that gets used Yeah, I try to avoid podcast, especially when I've just written, you know, just read and watched, you know, two books in a 13 hour miniseries that actually had proper incest in it it kind of it kind of taints the term a bit tainty um yeah so and and before that i was on bridging the rift and various other things and whatnot but that so that's kind of what i do mm-hmm. podcast wise and i'm an american i'm an american in case you couldn't tell an american i, I kind of worked <laughs> <laughs> okay so we're here to talk about i claudius yes we are um, I guess most people will be familiar, if they're going to listen to this, with the uh, BBC TV series. But obviously it started out initially as a book. In fact, two books. Written by Robert Graves. Yes, who was, uh, who was uh, well known already at the time for his autobiography, whose name I've forgotten about World War I. Um, help me. What is it? I'm looking it up right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not goodbye to all that, but it's one of those. It's uh, I'm looking at my book. It is sorry. It is goodbye to all that. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wrote that when he was in his early mid thirties, um, and it was his autobiography about having been like part of the World War One generation because he was born in 1895. Um, he had a pretty intense life as well, didn't he? He did. He did. He wrote many books. He lived a sort of uh, interesting life for someone considered a classical scholar, which is essentially what he was. Um, mm-hmm. My boss actually met him one day late in his life, not my boss's life, but Robert Graves' life, on the <laughs> island of Majorca, where Robert Graves had lived for a long time and where he died. I think he spent most of his life in Spain, didn't he? I believe he did. Yeah, I believe he did. Um, I, I don't know why. I don't know that much about him, except that he married several times and had kids, and yeah. uh, but kind of on the basis of his autobiography, became something well-known, and then in the mid-30s uh, came out with I, Claudius, the first of his two Claudius books, and that just sort of, I think, cemented him as uh, as one of the you know the great authors of at least a certain type of fiction in the age. Um, and just as a little side note, uh, I, Claudius, and I think they're usually taken together, I, Claudius, and the second book, Claudius the God, um, are was named, you know, when the end of this... 20th century happened and all those great lists of things. Essentially all those lists had I, Claudius in there somewhere generally in the top 20 or 25 of, of novels having written, been written in English. Um, it was pretty quickly and has since then not really lost a lot of its luster as being one of the greatest pieces of historical fiction written in English in the 20th century. So, so Claudius was emperor of Rome and that is and one thing that struck me watching the, the series, because I watched the series first, mm-hmm. and then reading through the book, I mean, you look at, even in, like, um, dramatic kind of fiction, you get these really kind of crazy, twisted families and, you know, all this kind of debauchery, and they got nothing on these, these guys. These, you know, these guys did it for real. And <laughs> right the way through, they're all, there's not that many likeable characters apart from possibly Claudius. Yeah. Certainly in the TV show, anyway. Yeah. No, that's definitely true. And I think I think that is something that comes from history in the novels. Um, the novels are heavily based. It's So it's a, a vaguely fictionalized in the sense that you get, you know, internal narration because they're both written in the first person of Claudius. Even mm-hmm. though he talks about things that happened well before he was born, 
Um, which means there's sort of this weird blend of him as a historian, which the actual Claudius was. He yeah. actually did write some work, some of which actually got, um, you know, were known, although they've been all lost to modernity. They were lost, you know, sometime in antiquity. Um, and so he does that. So he, you get an insight into character motivation and things like that that you wouldn't get otherwise. But most of the events, as it were, are taken from the ancient historians, none of which were contemporary, simply because there weren't many contemporary historians who wrote about that period for probably for fear of being killed. Um, but, you know, Tacitus, probably the greatest Roman historian, along with Suetonius and um, Dio... Uh, I've forgotten his second name. Anyhow, uh, it's, it's mainly Suetonius and Tacitus uh, who provide much of the material for uh, pretty much everything we see in Claudius and Claudius the God, although there's a lot in Claudius the God that comes from the Jewish and um, Greek writers uh, like Philo and things like that who wrote about King Herod the Great, who um, is not the one from the Bible, it's the grandson of the one from the Bible, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that factors into the second book especially. So they're all, as far as it is to be with with material that's 2,000 years old, they're fairly historically accurate in as much as this is when something happened and this person was banished and this person was killed and so on and so forth. So they don't go quite as far as the Tudors in kind of embellishing and kind of trying to sex uh, it up. They don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of sex and death in this story. That's pretty full on. Plenty and plenty, yeah. And, and Claudius was, just to give a brief bit of background, Claudius was... Um, the grandson of Livia, Livia being the second, uh, second wife or third wife. I, and anyhow, the long serving wife of the first emperor of Rome, uh, Caesar Augustus, who had been Octavian. Um, but they never had any children, um, which in the books is attributed to the fact that apparently he was not able to uh, have sex with Livia, which is kind of a crazy little idea. Couldn't rise to the occasion. Couldn't rise to the occasion, yes. Um, mm. Even though he... Which, when you consider what a complete bitch she was, <laughs> kind of understandable. But all of history is is verified. He was absolutely devoted to her. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not... How, whether and how much he knew of her black-hearted nature, which you know, a little bit of that could be jealousy. Maybe she wasn't quite as evil as... as all the writers say, but they all kind of agree that she did a lot of the dirty work, as it were, in keeping the empire together, and certainly did much of the actual day-to-day -day work of keeping the empire together. He had a really blind faith in her, didn't he? he? Just he would take her word above anyone else, and just didn't seem to. He seemed quite blind to a lot of the stuff that's going on. That's the impression you get. And yeah, no, completely and totally. <clears throat> and I think it started with, uh, with just the complete trust in her as a person, and then. I think it's the essentially the direct result of what happens when you when one man wields supreme power is that you don't want to upset him, even if the thing that he needs to know about, for example, is his doc his daughter's numerous numerous affairs and debaucheries. Um, so, I mean, that is one of the sort of key scenes in the in the miniseries. He gets uh, he kind of finally learns his daughter's not exactly the most chased woman in Rome. <laughs> well, in one way she was, but... <laughs> <laughs> Probably um, the least chased he, woman in Rome, Julia. Yeah. 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 Um, and he lines up all these senators and just one by one kind of tears on the strip. Yeah, and, and they, um, none of them deny it because they know that they've been caught. And so if he had any doubt beforehand, he, it's confirmed for him. And so um, he, uh, he arranges her banishment. And that actually, in fact, happened. Julia wasn't Julia, his daughter, um, his only surviving child, if I recall, um, by his earlier marriage, was banished. Um, mm -hmm. And so because there was no issue, as they say in royal terms, between Livia and, and Augustus, it left a vacuum for Livia's son, Tiberius. And per he wasn't the most popular guy in Rome, from what I gather. No, he never was. Um, he's not. I don't think he's quite as bad as he's portrayed in I Claudius. Or at least not in the mm -hmm. miniseries. Um, the books have a slightly more nuanced portrait of portrayal of him, where he's essentially someone who's torn between light and dark. 
And there are people he loves and that he admires and respects, and they kind of keep him on the straight and narrow, as it were, internally, spiritually. Um, but they're all, for various reasons, removed from him, generally because Livia needs them out of the way to make sure that he can become emperor. Mm. But it, He's forced to uh, divorce his first wife, isn't he? Yes. Sorry, I'm letting it And... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. His, his. I think he was very bitter about that, wasn't he? Tremendously bitter, and that's uh, his wife, Bitsania, and he loved her dearly, and so he was forced to divorce her, and then married to. Then went into a loveless marriage to Julia, mm-hmm. who had already been widowed twice by this point because her husband kept being killed because they were in Liv- Livia's way. Mm. Um. But he made a mess of it completely with Julia because they did not get on. And he went into a sort of vaguely self-imposed, vaguely imposed exile on Rhodes. It was not a sort of, um, you know, one man alone on an island. Like, he lived on Rhodes, and there were schools there and things. And there's um, a great bit in I, Claudius where he goes and tries to enroll in, like, the school of rhetoric or something at Rose. Because what do you do when you're a Roman gentleman who has nothing else to do? You go and you go take classes and things, and you become better at speaking, or you read histories or whatever. It's what a Roman does. And he goes and tries to enroll, and it, it had just been put out that essentially he was no longer being treated favorably by by Augustus and had kind of lost some of his honors. And they kind of told him, well, you can come back in seven days. We might have a free space then. Uh, because people had been doing things that he wanted because he was, you know, the stepson of Augustus. But then he was kind of starting to be treated like a normal citizen and was starting to feel that maybe he would just die on roads and never make it back to Rome. Well, in the, in the book, uh, you get the impression that, obviously it's told from Claudius's standpoint, and he kind of decides to go back to the beginning and kind of talk about his childhood growing up. And right from the start, because he was, um, when he was born, he was born lame, um, and he stuttered and stammered, and he had a lot of sort of nervous tics and things, and they just pretty much wrote him off from that point. Um, but I think he, I think he learned to use what they perceived as a weakness um, actually is a strength as you kind of follow his story through the book. Definitely. He, you know, he was born to um, the Lady Antonia, who was Mark Anthony's daughter, as I said several times, and uh, Drusus, who was a very, very high-ranked uh, Roman. And so it was, you know, and it was part of the imperial family as it came to be known. Um, but his father died shortly after his birth, and like you said, he was he was lame, and as it got older, he realized he had a he had a twitch and he had a stutter, and just people thought he was stupid, and so he kind of hid in the background. And so as all these other people are being got rid of in one way or another, or fighting amongst themselves for the throne, he kind of removed himself and lived a very private and secluded life for a long time. Uh, which I think kept him quite safe. Which kept, exactly kept him quite safe. No one thought he was a threat, and he did not make himself one. Even if, which even if he had tried, maybe he wouldn't have been able to. Um, mm. I think because he was seen as a bit of an embarrassment to the family, he kind of decided to go off and do his research into the history. Of, I think it was his father and his grandfather he wanted to do some basically write a, a biography of them. Yeah, his father Drusus and uh, his grandfather. Uh, Livia's first husband, whose name I, f- mm-hmm. I think is also Drusus, because there are a lot of names that overlap. Yeah, they repeat that a lot. Yeah, right? so you get people with eight names. You know, it's, his full name is Tiberius Claudius Drusus Nero Germanicus, and they granted him just rolls. It just rolls off the tongue. It really does, especially if you have a stutter like <laughs> he did. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so he was trying to write this history. And he's still a very young man at this point, and he was trying to write this history. And was going in it was going to express how his grandfather and father both had very strong sentiments for the return of the Republic, which Augustus had not ended, but essentially the Senate of Rome after the civil wars involving Mark Anthony, which you all know about, had Mm -hmm. granted Augustus essentially extreme uh, full executive power because they were unable to stop warring amongst themselves. And Augustus just kind of held on to it and it it slowly became a, you know, a monarchy. Um, And that's kind of the story actually of like Claudius is how Rome starts from, you know, a kind of temporary arrangement into just monarchy being the way of things. And 
he but he wants to write this story and, and his father and grandfather both have been very strong in favor of the republic being restored and Livia found out about it and put a stop to it because it was going to be subversive and so he started to write yeah, she, sorry she told him to write something about the was it about the religious rights yeah the religious uh, reforms that Julius uh, sorry that Augustus had made and so he did um, and then he wrote a history of the Etruscans. He was apparently the last person alive to know Etruscan. This is like an actual historical fact. Uh, there's, a, you know, the Etruscan language is completely lost to us, and apparently Claudius was the last person to know it. Uh, <laughs> well, there's a scene in the book, isn't there, where uh, lightning strikes a um, statue and strikes off the sea from Caesar. And I think I'm right in saying he translates that from Etruscan into, is it God? I forget. Yeah, it's, it's Augustus has just died and the Senate is debating whether or not to have him, to deify him, to turn him into a god, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Claudia says, both in the book and in the series, he says that, well, if you, you know, lightning strikes him off the sea from Caesar, what you have left is the word Ezer, which in Etruscan means God. And so clearly this was a prophecy that Augustus was, in fact, a god and should be deified, which the Senate did do. The Senate did deify Augustus, and there were temples built to Augustus and, and, and things offered to him and, you know, killing of sheep and whatnot in his honor. They were quite a um, superstitious bunch, weren't they, the Romans? Tremendously superstitious. <laughs> Claudius, not so much. And that, that's something that no. all sources tend to agree on, that he did what he was expected to do as a Roman citizen, but was not someone who went out of his way really to do the sort of various other rites and mysteries and rituals. Um, Mm -hmm. But the general populace of Rome, and especially the royal family, the imperial family, had had very many obligations and had a firm belief that, you know, the gods were jealous and angry and would do things that could be placated by sacrifices of this, that, or the other. There's a great story that happens in, actually in the second book, Claudius the God, hmm. of uh, a Roman army fighting in Morocco and losing and being lost in the desert and they're being attacked by the Moroccans and they're out of water and they hear from one of their local guides that the god of the area, the rain god, is Guagua or something like that. And there's right. a ritual by which if you give him beer, he will give you rain. And so they do it, and it rains. Sounds like a fact. Yeah, it seems fair to me. And so they do it, and it rains. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's kind of uncommented on by Claudius as he's telling you this, that, you know, whether or not this other god, who's not a Roman god, you know, somehow actually made it rain when the Romans needed it because they had placated him by beer. Uh, but it worked. <laughs> well, the, the other thing which surprised me when I watched the, the series the first time, because I was totally new to it, only watched it relatively recently, uh, was how much humour there is in the story. Do you think of it as quite a kind of a, you know, outwardly, it's quite a tough story, there's lots of murder going on, there's lots of intrigue, but there is a lot of humour in the story as well. There's a tremendous amount. It's a very black comedy slash melodrama. It's a, you know, I think it was a very tricky thing to try to take the books and turn it into a television because the books, which are brilliant, Mm. are not really dramatic in the sense that there's not, you know, it's there aren't, like, plot threads so much. It doesn't play out like a screenplay. Not even close. It's written very convincingly like a fake Roman history. It's written as mm. if it was written 2,000 years ago and then translated from the Latin. Like, you could yeah. pick up you could pick up Tacitus and read a passage and pick up some of Graves and read a passage, and you'd be surprised how good a mimic of that style Graves was. Mm-hmm. Which means there's very little dialogue. <laughs> there are long digressions about this or the other. That kind of because Claudius himself says that he's prone to these digressions, much like I am. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so to Jack Pullman was the writer, and I don't know what else he did, but he took the books and turned it into a really witty and dramatic and powerful, you know, thirteen part story. Mm. And I have no idea how he did it because it's just. It feels completely faithful to the book, but it's a completely other thing at the same time. It's it's like if you just took your history textbook and somehow made it come alive. Mm. That's a really tricky thing one to thing, do. One thing they um, talk about in the, the DVD extras on the UK release is they were really struggled at first. They had all the cast assembled um, and 
they were rehearsing and it just didn't flow it didn't work and they were all getting really frustrated um, and then the screenwriter came in and said I had exactly the same problem trying to write the screenplay and the way they eventually decided to go was to treat it as though it was the mafia <laughs> so if they played it as though they were the mafia it made sense so that's that's how they went with it that's which I found quite amusing yeah it is that's uh... <laughs> It's it's not that far off in some ways. Um, not really, no, 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 no horses' heads in beds. But there's some pretty freaky stuff that goes. And on. there is a horse who's made a senator, yeah, the noble senator yeah, in Catatus. Pretty cool. Yes. Um, which historical accounts vary as to whether or not it actually happened, but it's too good of a story to leave out. I'd like to think it. Did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, with the TV series, the I mean, one of the things that just blew me away was the assembled cast. I mean, they had... Yeah, just to have one or two of those names in a show would have been astonishing. But to get all of these really great actors together... I mean, admittedly, perhaps um, Derek Jacobi wasn't quite such a, a big name at that point in his career. But, you know, if you look at the assembled cast now, looking back at it from where we are now, it's it's amazing. Yeah, no, it really is. And it's it's sort of like... I think they handpicked a lot of people from the RSC. I'm pretty sure Jack and me was in the RSC at that time. Patrick yeah. Stewart, who turns up about halfway through uh, the series as Sejanus, who is the commander of the guard. A very hirsute, Patrick A very hirsute at the time, yes, before he lost his hair. Mm. Uh, yeah. He, he had been with the RSC, and he had done Shadowlock, mm. I believe, Merchant of Venice, among other roles. And you have George Baker, who's our own, and Brian Blessed as Augustus, which is probably yes. the best thing I've ever seen him do by a long shot. I saw an interview with him, and he fully expected to be offered Tiberius. He didn't expect to be offered Augustus at all. But I think he absolutely nails it. No, he completely does. He, he's completely believable as a very brilliant man who suddenly finds himself in situations getting worse and worse, and he's not sure anymore of himself as it goes on. And he becomes more and more focused on certain things, like Augustus... And this this is completely true. I had this weird obsession with marriage <laughs> and passed all sorts of laws encouraging marriage and, and regulating it and this and this that, and the other. Um, and it's like you're emperor of all Rome and you're spending your time worrying about people getting married too old. It seems a <laughs> bit weird, um, but he did. It, it was an actual genuine sort of obsession of his. I suppose he was empire building, wasn't he? He was trying to make sure that the next generation of Romans were going to come through for his campaigns in Germany and wherever. And I think that's exactly right. I think he, yeah, I think he somewhere knew that, you know, at a certain point he clearly resigns himself to the idea of it being, of Rome being a monarchy. Um, hmm. And that in order to maintain that, they're going to need a lot of men, because it's only going to be men, to rule the provinces, to fight the wars. You know, there were constant wars with the Germans, constant threats in the east from the Parthians and others, Con you know, constant worries about Africans and just sort of this massive empire, in a way, being held together by the will of one man. Uh, Although, ironically, it's a woman who's pulling the strings in the back. Yes. <laughs> ironically, <laughs> and probably not for the first time or last time in history. Behind every great man. Yes, indeed, as they say. And and Livia is truly a great woman. Um, in, in the great, yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah great at what she does. I mean, she's yeah. Nobody can beat her. At, at killing people. <laughs> but she's also, uh, you know, she actually does a lot of the running of the empire for Augustus. But mm. he's off worrying about you know marriage laws or, or silly things like that. She's there day to day, greeting ambassadors, dealing with requests from the provinces looking for the citizenship and senatorial roles, making sure people are being taxed properly. It's a tremendous amount of work that she undertook, and she built essentially an entire bureaucracy so that the empire would become self-perpetuating, even if, as later happened, the Caesars kind of go nuts. Hmm. Um, so that she built... Really? <laughs> I don't remember that bit. <laughs> <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> um, so just just in brief, you have Augustus, who is married to Livia, um, eventually poisoned by Livia or dies. It's hard to tell, but in the book in the movie, she's definitely he, she definitely poisons. And I've got to say, sorry to interrupt you, but I've got to say, um, although he gets a lot of stick for being very sort of booming and over the top, Brian Blessed, that death scene is incredible. It is phenomenal. It is a long close up of his dead face, essentially. Like he dies, mm. he's he's been ill. 
and he's lying in bed and Livia comes to him one last time to talk to him and essentially she doesn't quite confess but she essentially does to him a lot of her crimes yeah and during the course of the speech which she's kind of doing off screen you don't see her it's just this voice wafting in from somewhere it's a close-up of his face as he slowly dies and then he dies but she keeps talking, and so you just have this close-up of it completely still Brian Blessed. It almost yeah. could be a photograph, but you can tell it's not. And They were talking to one of the production guys, and he said you can see the light go out of his eyes, and it's, it's really very... Yeah, it's a great piece of acting for. I know it sounds really daft. He's just lying there, but you know you really get the you get the moment. You really do. You completely believe that Augustus is dead, um, mm. which is just and it's treated with a good amount of dignity, uh, more so yeah. than any of the other deaths. I think of of all the main characters except for Olivia. Yeah, I think at heart he was probably he seemed, came across as a very good man, but just maybe kind of lost the plot and trusted people he shouldn't have trusted yeah yeah and it, i think it all depends on whether you kind of subscribe to the idea that livia puts forth that at all times you have to do what is best for rome i'm sure in her own head she thought she was doing exactly yeah the best thing yeah or whether it's a great villain or do. whether you look at him as some sort of usurper of you know power that should have returned to the people after a period of mm. calm or something um but certainly one of the greatest of the Roman emperors and one of the longest survived. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and that scene, and, and Livia finishes talking. Olivia is being played by, do you say it's Sean Phillips? Or is it? Yeah, that's how I pronounce okay, it. Okay, because it's S. That, that's, the, that's the Brit way. Because <laughs> I look at that. I wanna, how would you call it? Well, I, I don't know how you say S-I-A-N with an, with an accent circumflex over the I. I think it's, I think it's Irish. It, it, I think it is as well. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the female of your Sean. Yes. <laughs> I mean, not, not as evil as my Sean is. Uh, ah, now come on. <laughs> he's a sweetheart. Yeah. Right? But anyhow, she comes back on screen and she finishes her speech and she's crying. And it's one of the few times you see her cry. And you can tell yeah. that she, even though she had to kill Augustus, she's terribly sad at mm. his death. Um and oh, while we're on the subject of her, I really love that scene. Um, I don't know if you remember where she's chatting to the royal poisoner. They're sat there together and they're kind of exchanging anecdotes about, oh, well, I poisoned this guy using this, and I poisoned this guy using this. And it's a shame that you don't get to use your poison knowledge, isn't it, Livia? <laughs> um, whoa, uh, yeah. And then she starts looking at her food and thinking, Oh my god! And she's like, "No, no, no! You just got wind." <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I didn't poison you. Yeah, no, Martina. Um, yes. Which is a scene completely contrived for the miniseries. It's not in the book at all. Ah, right. Um, because in the in the book and apparently in history, Martina, who was a poisoner who was used by some friends of Tiberius to bump off one of Tiberius's enemies, uh, Germanicus, who was mm-hmm. Claudius's brother, um, yeah, is killed fairly quickly. Uh, once the plot is kind of uncovered and, and things start to go downhill, she's fairly quickly killed so that she cannot give any sort of testimony or evidence about what she did and when she did it. Yeah. Um, but instead, the, the miniseries decides to have a lovely little moment where the two <laughs> poisoners kind of sit and talk and discuss their uh, discuss their trade, and it's just delightful. Um, so, so Augustus dies, and having killed... Five to six potential successors. I'm trying to remember all. They're going down like flies. Aren't yeah, they? Tiberius is declared emperor by the Senate, um, mm-hmm. and she thinks she's going to control Tiberius. But over time, Tiberius comes to be controlled by um, Sejanus, who is the captain of his guard. Um, and then Livia dies um, at a fairly ripe old age, having made Claudius and Caligula both promise that when they become emperor, because she has a prophecy saying that they're both become emperor after Tiberius dies, Mm -hmm. that they'll, that they'll deify her because she knows that even though she thinks she did it all for the good of Rome, she knows that she's killed many people and done terrible things. And she thinks she's going to be burning in hell until she gets deified, which is, but Caligula, make, Caligula makes her feel so much better about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on her deathbed, he comes and says, "No one makes you think a smelly old thing like you can become a goddess." <laughs> yeah. just, it's just, You're going to. Yeah, hurt. it's just it's John Hurt playing Caligula, and it's just an amazingly over the top, but completely perfectly pitched performance as you know, probably the maddest mm. of the mad Roman emperors. 
Um, I was talking to someone at work the other day who had just got the DVD set, and I said, I won't spoil it for you, but John Hurt is amazing. He said, well, the stuff I've seen before is just John Hurt being John Hurt. And I said, well, you're going to see him in a whole new light after watching this. (laughs) Yeah, it's actually funny when I just said that Livia was a great woman. The thing that occurred to me was in Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter, where (laughs) John Hurt playing Ollivander says to Harry that Voldemort's wand was similar to his and that you can do great things. And he said, yes, he did terrible things, but great. And there's this idea <laughs> that great can be, you know, you can have great evil, too, yeah. in the sense that it, yeah. is, it is truly impressive all that Livia has done. Um, and her death is handled really interestingly in the miniseries, where it's sort of this mm. moment where old Claudius, who's writing the book, and it's kind of the framing device, is remembering that Livia is dying and he's been called for. And he comes mm-hmm. and promises her that he will make her the queen of heaven if he becomes emperor. Um, she dies and of, of natural causes, being just very old by that point. And Tiberius kind of sinks completely into a, a degeneracy of weird sexual practices and pretty epic proportions. Yeah, and lives on Capri and never comes to Rome anymore and just sort of leaves the entire running of, of the empire to Sejanus and... and um, there's that whole scene with him very early on where he's with Ian Ogilvy. I don't know who Ian, o- Do who Ian Ogilvy is. Uh, he played the saint in The Return of the Saint, <laughs> sort of 1970s program. Who did he play in this? Um, <laughs> oh, God. Was uh, it his I brother, Drusus? Remember. Were they brothers? Was it Drusus? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're, that's they're, his brother. I'm sure they were yeah, brothers. Drusus. Yeah, Drusus. Yeah. And that, that got a bit, um, how can I put it, homoerotic? There's a, there's a very odd undercurrent in that scene. It's a brilliant scene where they're they're scraping each other's backs after the mm. bath and they've been fighting and wrestling as, as Romans do. And Tiberius is talking about how he has really dark thoughts and and Drusus is such a good man. He has no idea of how dark his thoughts are and things. And Drusus is trying <laughs> to laugh it off but you clearly see that Tiberius is a tormented yeah. man even so early in his life. Um... They learned a lot from the Greeks. They learned many things from the Greeks. There is there mm-hmm. is a report, at least, or there is some indication that uh, Claudius, our hero, our supposed hero, at least, is the only of the emperors of that period not to have had at least some homosexual encounter of some kind, which is kind of interesting. That's kind of ironic as well. It is, yeah. Because he was apparently too moral for that or something. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. So... Tiberius is emperor and is just kind of living with degeneracy, but he is warned by Claudius's mother, Antonia, Mark Antony's daughter, mm-hmm. as we are always reminded, um, of a plot against him by Sejanus and Antonia's daughter, Lavilla, who had already poisoned Tiberius's son, Castor, um, because they want to usurp the throne. And he's, he's warned in time, and he, in very old age, so he doesn't actually receive control, essentially. He just kind of picks different puppets who will kill the puppets he already had. Mm-hmm. And in one of the most harrowing scenes you'll ever watch anywhere on anything, Antonia is given charge of her daughter, Lavilla to punish as she sees fit. Oh, uh, yeah. And what she does is lock her in her bedroom and sits outside the door and Claudius comes running and like all Mer- all Rome is just going crazy because people everyone who is an ally of Sejanus is being killed they're being everyone's being arrested and it's just mass slaughter sort of purge of all of the elements that had been aligned to Sejanus seeing that he was on the ascendancy and now he's going down and it's going down hard and so Claudius mm-hmm. runs in and Antonia is sitting in a chair and, and it's Margaret Tyzak I think is how you say her name you yes know? that's right she's fin- everyone seriously everyone is phenomenal on this thing even like mm-hmm. small bit players who have like one scene are great um yeah. but she's sitting there and her daughter is pounding on the door to be let out um yeah. and she's sitting in front of it and Claudia says what are you you're just gonna let her sit in there and Antonia says I'm not gonna move until she dies that is her punishment. That's cold. That is her punishment. And Claudius is like, you're just going to sit there the whole time. And she says, that is mine for having done this and for raising such a horrible daughter. And it's just so, chilling. it's just chilling. It's completely chilling. Mm-hmm. I think that's the end of episode eight or something. And it just leads this crazy pitch of 
Claudia screaming. Then it just goes batshit crazy. It, it really does. It really does. <laughs> Everyone has been killed, and um, Claudia screams, Rome, you are finished. You are ruined. Because um, he just thinks there's no way that Rome can recover from this massive purge. But it does. Um, and the interesting thing, in a weird way, about a lot of this stuff is that and Claudia says this in the book that by and large, with the exception of a few hundred people who are senators and the imperial family and their friends and connections, you know, the empire goes on day to day business as if none of this is going on. Like there are always, you know, there are stories and rumors and people know this and people know that and they talk about that and they gossip about this and they write silly songs. But, you know, the army's still defending the frontiers and trade is happening and, it's still Roman glory, you know, it's still the Pax Romana, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is just at the very top that everything is going to shit. Business as usual. Yeah, which is always an interesting thing when you look at it from a historical point of view. How often do yeah. other societies have terrible things going on up top and people down the, people down on the ground just kind of go about their lives. Um, so Tiberius kind of comes to the end of his reign. Yes. He doesn't get poisoned though, does it? Well, not completely and utterly no he if I remember yeah right. no yeah. There's, there's an incident where he he dies or they think he dies and Caligula who had been named oh, his that's so who had been named his successor uh, co-successor I should say with uh, Tiberius's grandson Gamellus who doesn't feature much and doesn't do much um Caligula walks out and says, you know, <laughs> I've been given the ring and uh, goes on this wonderful speech about how his, you know, adopted <laughs> father Tiberius is doing all this. Um, and then Tiberius wakes up. He wasn't actually dead. <laughs> and starts calling for his dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and so they go and they smother him. <laughs> Cause, as you do. As you do. Because they're done waiting. It's, it's yeah. now the time of Caligula. And Caligula, whose name means Little Boot, um, who and who had as a child helped put down a possible rebellion by the German legions, which is an interesting little story, got a very uh, warm reception when he first became emperor because he was the son of Germanicus, who had been. Mm-hmm. Um, he was really the one that all the Roman people got behind. They didn't really want Tiberius, from what you read in the book. No, they all thought Germanicus was should have been the emperor. Yeah, no, and it's and it's well attested that when they offered the emperorship to Tiberius, he was very cunning about saying no and then accepting after they reoffered and things like this because he knew he was in kind of tenuous position. Um, but Germanicus, who was Claudius's brother, um, was a very, very noble Roman of the sort of old sort. Um, and the actors... He was kind of the only one who really treated Claudius with any respect from the family. Yes, he definitely was from the family. And he, Claudius eventually made other friends, but the only one within the family who never looked down on Claudius really was Germanicus. Mm. Um, but by, and Caligula was his son. Um, Germanicus by this point had been killed in a plot, um, involving the lady Martina. Um, mm-hmm. and so Caligula becomes emperor and people are like, Oh, the son of Germanicus to rule us. All of Rome is saved. Blah, blah, blah. What could possibly happen? <laughs> <laughs> Not knowing that he was just bonkers, completely an, Utterly insane. And he, like, everything you've ever heard about Caligula's reign, almost certainly some of it is not true, but most of it is true. Yeah. And, you know, from marrying and then killing his sister to, although it didn't happen the way it happened in the miniseries. The uh, miniseries has a really crazy scene where he tries to pretend like he's Kronos or, and swallow his child, and that's just yeah. really unpleasant to see. Not, not the rubbish monster from Doctor Who. No, 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 God, no, no, now you're on the time monster. Oh, no, you ruin everything by mentioning the time monster. Come, Kronos, come! We did come. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's anyway, okay, Yeah, so... Um, so, and he... That was a pretty intense scene, wasn't it's it? It's a tremendously he, intense scene. It, yeah, he comes staggering out of the room, and his mouth is just covered in blood, and it's just... Oh, sickening. Yeah, and you you realize what's happened, and and Claudius walks in, and you don't see what he sees, but you see that he gets very upset by seeing it. That's actually an end of the episode. (laughs) And one thing I was struck by watching it, I know it was made in 76, it seemed quite racy for its time. It seemed quite racy for this time. Mm -hmm. I was looking at it, and I'm I'm sure it aired 
fairly later in the night. Almost certainly had to have been after the watershed because they mm-hmm. they show female nudity, they show yeah. rear male nudity, they show two men kissing, they show quite a bit of blood, they show severed yeah. heads, um, and they almost show a mother and a son kissing in a passionate way. They, that was freaky. I think they. I think that's the line they realized they couldn't cross, and so they cut right before the kiss happened between. Yeah, and I, for one, I'm quite pleased about that because <laughs> Christopher Biggins, bless him, I just I don't want to see that. I don't know it's him from pleasant. anything else, so all I know for him from is this, and so in my mind, he just kind of is Nero. He kind of has a, like a cult status in the UK. He's um, uh, he was in a lot of kind of kids TV and. Um, He's more known now as a, like a sort of uh, almost like a reality star. He was in the UK version of "I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here," <laughs> you know, where they feed you bugs and stuff, uh, crazy stuff like that. And um, yeah, he kind of pops up on those sorts of programs. Um, but yeah, I, the thought of seeing him and his mum together that wasn't a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it's tremendously racy. It's not. Mm. It's not really family viewing. But at the same time, it's so funny because, yeah, it aired in the BBC, it aired in the UK in 76, yeah. and aired in the States on Masterpiece, uh, Masterpiece Theatre on PBS, I think in the late 70s mm-hmm. or early 80s, not long after, and was a huge, phenomenal success. I mean, yeah. I don't remember ever not knowing about I, Claudius. We were kind of the family mm-hmm. that watched PBS and stuff like that. That's all I know about Doctor Who and mm-hmm. various other things. But, I mean, yeah. it's kind of this thing that people are aware of even 30 years later. It just a huge phenomenon in the States to the point where it spawned mm. a charming little Sesame Street spoof, Me Claudius, that you sent me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. They used to do mo- the best thing is a little caterpillar <laughs> across the, uh, the picture. That's great. Yeah, because the, the opening of I, Claudius is a like a mosaic tile of Claudius's face with a snake crawling across it and some crazy mm-hmm. awesome music that I just love. Now, when I first started watching this, I just thought, that's the worst theme tune in the universe ever. <laughs> it sounded like a herd of elephants having a fight and sort of stampeding through some kind of uh, northern Yorkshire brass band. It was, but having said that, after having watched, you know, how many hours of it, uh, it kind of gets into your head. It really does. It really does. It's. Uh... It's one of those theme tunes that's unlike any other sort of theme tune that you mm. might, you know. I don't know what else they could have done, but you know, they can't do like da 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 for I Claudius. But <laughs> um, the opening flourish quite often um, scares our cat. It's, She'll jump it's meant to be, I think, a bit scary. It's a sort of, blah, 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 sort of sound. And it's a bit chilling. And then in comes this... Bah, 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 that's just really <laughs> awesome. And it, and it just screams Rome to me in a way. I don't know why. Yeah. But it's, I've been converted. I, I, I must admit, I, I like it now. I think you should because it's kind of awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe have it as a ring. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> if I could find it, I would totally do that. <laughs> I would just love to hear my phone go... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm sure Chris Burgess could make you one. He seems to be pretty he's good. He's very good. Chris Burgess is a man of many talents. Not the actor mm, Chris Burgess, the Radio Free Star Chris Burgess. I didn't realize there was any other. There's the Chris Burgess, Burgess who appeared in several episodes of Doctor Who back in the day, back in the uh, Perth. Uh, not the Chris Burgess, though. <laughs> you can tell that to him. Um, <laughs> but we're straying from the point. Yeah, we are a bit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Caligula. Crazy guy. C- completely crazy and just kind of acts crazy. It's actually, it's funny. It's the Caligula section is just 
it's only about two episodes that he's emperor. I think it's two. Yeah. yeah it's nine and ten, I think. And it's just mm-hmm. so crazy and so over the top. It's almost hard to watch because you're just like, what the hell is going on? And also from Claudius's point of view, I think, for me anyway, it was the only time where you really consider that he's thinking about, seriously thinking about getting rid of him because he's just going to completely tear down Rome if he's left in charge. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the... And there's some... Not spec, not evidence, but speculation that Claudius at least knew of the plot to assassinate Caligula before it happened and things. Um, and it's certainly... Because while he seems to know about the machinations, he kind of ducks out of the way of it and kind of avoids it as much as possible, but you just get that inkling that he's worried yeah. that it's all going to go completely... Yeah, <laughs> and it's and it's also the first time I think in the miniseries that you're actually concerned for Claudius's safety. Like mm-hmm. he'd been berated and ignored and spat upon essentially by everyone before that. Mm-hmm. But Caligula actually rises him, you know, raises him to a level of consul with him, and so it's like uh, Claudius's first entry into public life. He's already 37 at the time, but you know he gives him impossible tasks to do, and he threatens to kill him on numerous occasions, and it's only by Claudius. Well, there's that scene, isn't there, where he he comes to the realization that he's a god. And Claudius has to really think on his feet, and he has to kind of go along with it. And uh, he does a pretty good job, actually. He does a very good job. He does a very, very good job. And he he's just had he's just had the audience with the god uh, Caligula, as it were. And he comes in to his room where um, where Herod, his best friend King Herod, uh, mm-hmm. is sitting with Drusilla, who is is Caligula's sister and kind of wife. Um, mm-hmm. Says. Um, he's a god. Oh, by the way, before sending Drusilla to him, says, oh, by the way, you're a god, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's repeated the next scene where the head of the guards, the new head of the guards, Macro, who helped kill Sejanus, is saying, brings in a bunch of senators and gives this speech about how the emperor has gone through a metamorphosis, as he says. And mm-hmm. it's it's um, John Reese davies is the actor's yeah. name. Yeah, so you might know from the Nina Jones films and many other things. Lord of the Rings as well. Oh, was he then? I've never... Yeah, he's the dwarf in Lord of the Rings. I've never seen them. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I just... I'm bad at such things. But... (laughs) You should get around to it. I I had an ex who tried to make you watch the the first movie like three different times and by the first half Mm. of the first movie I was just like, please, can we do anything else but watch this? Yeah, kind of puts you off. (laughs) (laughs) But Macro gives this great speech to the senators who've been called to the palace to, you know, greet the new god emperor saying... The Emperor's gone through his metamorphosis. He has become a god. Oh, and by the way, Drusilla's become a goddess. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of warns the Senate. And the Senate, instead of showing any sort of backbone or any initiative, decides to fall and worship him. And it's just sort of yeah. emblematic of how terrified and unable to act independently the nobility of Rome, which is the Senate, essentially, has become. Mm-hmm. It's degenerated into this complete sort of um, Eastern style, as they used to say, you know, total monarchy that just mm. just means bloodshed and war. Um, and eventually Caligula... I like the scene... No, so, you go for it. I was going to say, I like the scene where I think Caligula's been seriously ill and uh, he makes his amazing recovery. And one of the senators has said that um, he prayed to the gods that you know, he would give his life if they'd say Caligula... So Caligula comes through and he says, oh, it's amazing. You, you, you made such a recovery. It's great. I prayed for you. Yes, I heard about that. And, um, well, didn't you say that you would give your life if I lived? Yes. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> what do you mean? Um, well, I'm still here. It shouldn't be right that you're here as well. You don't want to kind of go back on what you said to the gods. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty cool scene. Yeah, no, it is. It's a great scene. And it's it's... It's in the book in a different fashion where it's not it's not a senator. It's just like people put it up in their, their shop windows. Mm-hmm. Um, and after he recovers, Caligula sends the guards out to make those people kill themselves. <laughs> 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 and Caligula is just sort of, he's so mad and he's so erratic that you can't win for losing. Like, there's no way to work around yeah. him. It's, you can't second guess him at all. Yeah, you can't second guess him. You can't anticipate what he's going to do. And you can't, you know, kind of play him. It only mm. Claudius, it seems, is and just by sheer luck, many times that his knowledge of Homer <laughs> yeah. gets gets through not being dead. 
Um, mm. And Caligula, as a joke, that kind of backfires, marries him to a young uh, noblewoman, uh, Valeria Messalina, mm-hmm. who's Claudius's third wife. He had had two other wives who you barely see or yeah. meet because they, neither one of them liked him very much. No. Nor did he care for them very much, for that matter. No, I got that impression as well from the book. Yeah. His first wife was a giant woman who apparently no one else will marry, and so the royal, the imperial family kind of marries her off, him off to her. And then I'll... She was the daughter of one of Livia's friends or something? A granddaughter, I think, yeah. Er, oh. Ergonalia. Ergonalinia. I'm going to say it wrong, because yeah. it's a very tricky Roman name. Um, yeah, but an old friend of Livia's, and just two evil grandmothers kind of cackle as they marry their undesirable grandchildren to each other. And then she had, he had a second wife who was um, Sejanus' sister, which put him in good stead during that era, but almost brought him down, except for the fact that uh, his mother, Antonia, was the one who warned Tiberius of the plot against him from Sejanus, so he got spared there. But then he marries Messalina. That was a great scene as well, wasn't it? Do you remember that, where uh, Patrick Stewart, Sejanus, says to him, uh, well, of course, you're going to have to divorce your wife. You know, she's, she's been unfaithful to you. Oh, right, okay, yeah, that's fine. Claudius agrees. And he's just making his way to the door, and Patrick Stewart says, well, who are you going to marry? Well, I don't know, I've just got divorced. (laughs) (laughs) You should marry my sister. And within two minutes, he's kind of divorced and married in the blink of an eye. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And then he gets called to task for it at one of the many sort of like, that would be like kitchen table scenes now, but they're banquet scenes. Yeah. And it's it's him and Agrippina, who is his brother Germanicus's widow, and is a mm-hmm. great enemy of Tiberius in some ways, and, and Antonia and uh, Herod. And essentially, he gets he gets scolded heavily by everyone for having agreed to marry Sejanus' sister, and how you know evil Sejanus is. And and there's a great moment where Agrippina um, is talking about how Sejanus is having um, an affair with someone, or uh, but. And yes, it's Sejanus is, is having an affair with someone, and Antonia says, but he's a married man with children, and Agrippina says, what kind of world do you think we're living in? <laughs> and it's clear that until that moment, Antonia was so traditionally old-school Roman hmm. that she just assumed people were behaving honorably. <laughs> She missed a lot of what was She going missed on. everything until she find mm. until she finds out about the plot from Lavilla and Sejanus to kill Tiberius. She's mm. completely in the dark, and after that moment, she can't really quite go back. And she mm. eventually, under the reign of Caligula, kills herself because she just cannot bear to live anymore. She's mm. really lived past her time in in a way, yeah. and hasn't been able to move with the currents the way Claudius does. Um, and so Caligula is eventually assassinated. Um, by a group of senators and head of the guard. Now, we can't write out the final part of Caligula's story before mentioning... The dance? That scene. That scene. <laughs> that's just... That's mental. Uh, <laughs> In a fantastic way. Yeah, it's completely it's completely insane. Uh, Claudius is sleeping with his, with his prostitute friend, Copernia, because that's what he does when he's not with his wives, which is you, yeah. most of the time. And he lives very modestly. He has no money during most of Caligula's reign because it's all been taken from him by Caligula in various ways. Uh, Cal- mm-hmm. Because Caligula was always spending so much money, he always needed to kind of keep robbing people and killing people for their money. And so he comes, the guards come to get him in the middle of the night and says, you're one in the palace right now. And everyone thinks, oh my God, I'm going to die. So he goes and there are two other senators, <laughs> Marcus Finicius, and I forget the third one's name. And they're sitting there, and they're holding hands in the dark in, like, the palace, and they have no idea what's going to happen to them. They think they're going to be killed. They've been there for, like, hours. Yeah, they're they? left sitting for hours, and then suddenly, like, these candles descend, these, like, oil lamps descend from the ceiling. <laughs> and and there's Caligula, John Hurt, done all up in gold paint with, like, just enough to cover his... And in, in, in kind of pretending to be a woman, so he's wearing, like, a bikini kind of thing, yeah. almost, and very skimpy. And these, like, golden chiffon sort of scarves. And he does this dance pretending to be the goddess Dawn. And it is just completely insane. I'm seeing a whole new James Bond intro sequence. From- <laughs> I think that could really work. <laughs> and, it's, and it's just, it's a sight to see. It's yeah, a sight to see. And, uh, of course, Claudius has to then kind of rein himself in and say, well, that, that was incredible, that was amazing, and uh, just kind of just go with the flow. Yeah, see, I've never seen a dance that gave me more spiritual fulfillment and whatnot. Yes. Which is funny, because dance is actually terrible. 
like by and large, Caligula is not a good dancer, and so John Hurt is, and and maybe John Hurt is or isn't. I don't know, but Caligula certainly isn't, and so the dance is actually kind of rubbish in some ways. <laughs> um, in a so bad it's good. One. <laughs> But this is just one of many. And actually, Marcus Vinicius, I remember his name because he's then one of the assassins. He's one of the people in the ah, plot. Yeah. And so Caligula's killed. And for the first time, but not the last time in Roman history, um, the guards, the Praetorian guard, the elite guard stationed in Rome, 4,000 strong, say, well, if there's no emperor, we don't have jobs anymore. And so they start to loot the palace. And then they find Claudius and hiding behind the curtain. <laughs> And he's the most reluctant emperor. The most reluctant ever, and they decided to declare him emperor. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a really good scene in the miniseries that's not in the book, where the Senate says, you know, the Senate's like, you can't just declare yourself emperor. Like, we declare the emperor. And Claudius says, yes, I know, but you, as you see, I'm surrounded by guards, and they're, you know, this is not a situation that you can talk your way out of in a way. And so the some of the senators come to the palace and Claudius is there saying, you know, you say that I'm deaf and you say that I have a stammer and you say that I am half-witted. Um, and he just gives this wonderful speech about how, you know, isn't it more important, you know, it's like, yes, I'm hard of hearing, but you'll find that I never fail to listen. Yes, I may have a stammer, but isn't it more important what a man says than how long he takes to say it? Um, and it's, a great, it's a great speech in the end by saying, you know, yes, I have half wits. Maybe I'm a half wit, but I've seen many people die who had all of their wits. So apparently quality of wits is more important than quantity. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great it point. is. It is. And he said to son, you know, I'll, I'll come tomorrow and you can decide to make me emperor or not. But if you don't, you're the one who has to tell the guard what they're deal- you know, what you're going to do. Like mm-hmm. I'm not. This is not my problem. Essentially, I'm at this point. I'm purely just a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Senate, not being total fools, realize that they are not going to get the Republic back anytime soon. So they make an emperor. Mm. And I think it, he, he, in his heart of hearts, wanted to kind of lay down the foundations to restore the Republic, didn't he? Yeah, he, 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 like his father and grandfather and his brother, to a certain extent, were definitely Republicans. <clears throat> in the sense that they thought Rome was best ruled by, uh, by you know, the elite, essentially the nobles, in a representative fashion, but it just wasn't going to happen at this point. It's no. it's very difficult ever to go back to sort of that sort of representative style or at least vaguely representative government when you have instituted something or something like an absolute monarchy. But he still has hopes of that, and that's that's where the first. It's interesting. The first book ends with him becoming emperor. That's the end of part 10 of 13 in the miniseries. Yeah. Um, they do that by greatly emphasizing in the miniseries, like, the first elements of Claudius' life and spending a lot of time with Livia and Augustus and whatnot. And also by kind of shoehorning in some stuff from the second book throughout um, the miniseries, dealing with Herod Agrippa, mm-hmm. who doesn't appear until the, the second book, really. Because uh, a lot of it's told in flashback, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and so you can get in the, TV, in the show. TV show. Yeah, it's all kind of told in flashbacks where he's writing the story late at night as he's kind of in the waning years of his reign. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so he he becomes emperor and becomes a fairly good emperor. Um, Claudius the God deals a lot. The book deals a lot with him time his time in the law courts and in hearing cases. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of time is dealt with that, and then it's completely skimmed over in the miniseries because it's not that interesting. I don't think to try to dramatize mm-hmm. hundreds of cases and efficiency of juries and whatnot. Sure. So what it does focus on heavily is is Messalina, his wife, who he trusts implicitly, just like Augustus trusted Livia. Um, mm, but that about him. Yeah, and. <laughs> Instead of being a good sort of queen who kills people on the side, Messalina is like Julia or one of these other characters and is just debauched as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is all the more creepy when you realize that she's no more than like 20 at the time. Messalina yeah. was 15 when she was married to Claudius, so she must have died before she was 30. And she's very young indeed, and she's. She, once when Claudius is away, because he goes and conquers Britain. Hey! <laughs> um, and actually makes a, makes a show of it. Um, <laughs> once when he's away, Messalina decides to 
host a competition among between herself and the head of the prostitutes guild because such a thing while informal did exist to mm-hmm. see who could wear out the most men <laughs> Yeah, that's another memorable story. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's kind of the whole concept of it. It's just sort of like, you're the empress of, oh my god, what are you doing, woman? And apparently all of Rome knows this is going on because they're, you see in the scene there are senators and there are free men and they're just all the, all the ranks of society are represented there. And the prostitute comes in and Messalina's kind of, henchman's not the right word, but her little like friend who helps organize these things is an actor called Minester. Mm-hmm. And he and the, the prostitute have some great banter, and then Messalina and the prostitute have some great banter, and the prostitute's just a hysterical character. And she holds her own against him the, as well, because he thinks he's, you know, the the big I am, and she kind of puts him back in his place. She does, and she, her favorite line, or my favorite line of hers is she, um, uh, she says, the difference between this humble, this noble lady and myself is that what she does for a hobby, I do for a profession. My hobby <laughs> happens to be gardening. <laughs> which is, I love that. And she said, for which I do not expect to be paid, because she expects to be paid for saving all these men. And so they settle, and they have it. And, and Methelina wins. Sleeps with more men, like 23 or 24, I think the numbers say to that. And it's just sort of ridiculous amounts of, of <laughs> sexual carnality going on. And oodles of nudity, too, in this in this era. Of the TV show, like there's a lot of lot of lot of breasts and things flying about. Yeah, I'm all down for that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you would be. Um, <laughs> and then, but she decides to just kind of take it one step further, and either through trickery, as it's done in the book, or just through plain deceit, essentially in the miniseries, she divorces Claudius. And marries this man essentially while Claudius is away, you know, not that far away. He's in Ostia, which is the harbor. Yeah. You know, not that far away, but he's out of the city. And marries this other man and is essentially trying by doing so to bring the city around to her. And by the time Claudius gets back, there will, he will no longer be emperor. Mm. And so he has to kill her. Um, he has to kill them all. Mm. And he does. And it's. And in between, Messalina had been completely manipulating him to put people that favored her in positions of authority, put, you know, use his authority, which he kind of granted her. He gave her use of his seal so she could write letters on his behalf. And she was just corrupt as corrupt can be. That's another throwback to Livia, isn't it? Because she had Augustus's seal while he was ill. Yeah. Yeah, no, it really is. And it's sort of like the difference. I love comparing, like, the beginning of the story in a weird way and the end of the story because Messalina is a lot like Livia in that she has his complete trust. Yeah. But Livia uses that very rarely does she use it for her own personal ends. I think Livia's a smart cookie. She's a very smart cookie. Whereas Messalina is very intelligent, but I don't know if it's because she's young or just because she's vicious, but she almost always uses that power for her own pleasure and gain. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting comparing these two sort of, you know, Lady Macbeth kind of characters where <laughs> Livia you get very sympathetic towards by the end because you yeah it's true you believe that she thought she was doing what she should do what was best for Rome as she says Messalina is just a terrible person and yeah. just and it's just horrible and so when she gets killed in a very gripping scene um, it's it's shocking but it's not you don't feel bad for her at least I didn't no and I agree yeah and then just kind of Claudius decides, you know what? Screw it. I'm done. I'm done trying to be good at this. I'm I'm over. I'm I, I you know, I made a mistake. I should have been a terrible tyrant and then maybe people would have overthrown me and yes I would have died, but Rome would have had the Republic back. Well now yeah. I'm gonna make sure they do by doing everything I can to make sure that Nero, that terrible, awful Nero, is the next the next emperor to the point where he marries his niece, Nero's mother, Agrippinilla. Mm-hmm. Who was Jim- who was uh yeah. Who was his brother Germanicus' his daughter. Yeah, they were a close knit family. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was only so many people that you could marry if you were of that family and but the the niece thing they did have to get a decree from the Senate saying that it was okay. There's a, a funny reference in the book where on the day that the Senate 
grants the decree that a, a fraternal uncle can, uncle can marry his niece. Um, apparently, Agrippinella puts one of the guards up to it or something so that Claudius mm-hmm. and Agrippinella are not the only couple getting married. But otherwise, they would have been the only ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the two of, between Agrippinella and Nero, and she connives with one of Claudius's advisors. And he's aware of all this in the story. He's, mm-hmm. He knows it's happening. He knows his time is coming short. He knows he's done for it. And he puts all his hopes on his son, Britannicus, who may or may not be his son, because it's Messalina's child, so who knows, mm-hmm. um, to kind of restore the Republic. And Britannicus comes and says, I don't want that. I, I, I wanted my chance to be emperor. And in in the book, he says flat out, look, we're never going to have the Republic again. Their choice now are between good emperors and bad emperors. Mm-hmm. And he even says a good emperor like you were before you killed my mother <laughs> or before you married a Grippinella. <laughs> like, you used to be a good emperor, now you're a bad one. Um, yeah. And he says, give me my chance to be a good emperor. And Claudius says, well, I guess I can't force you. He had a secret plan that was going to involve sending him to Britain to hide him and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And instead, he just kind of lets himself be poisoned, and we know that Britannicus is shortly thereafter killed by Nero, who assumes power in Rome, and uh, Nero then eventually kills his mother. And thus ends... He did a great job, Nero. <laughs> he, uh, yeah. <laughs> He's, um... There was that scene, isn't there, with uh, Nero, where... Uh, is it a map get set on fire? They're burning the book. Agrippinilla and Nero, That's after it. Claudius dies, find the book that we've been, That's you it. know, the manuscript. the manuscript for I, Claudius, essentially. And yeah. and they burn it, and Nero's looking at it and saying, what a pretty thing a fire is. <laughs> <laughs> Going into that old chestnut that Nero set started the fire of London. He almost certainly yeah, did not yeah. set the fire of London, and he certainly didn't fiddle while it happened. But, yeah. And that's that's the story, and it's... Very dark. Did you say Fire of London? So, did I say Fire of London? Fire of Rome, sorry. Yeah. Fire of London. <laughs> Everyone knows that was the fifth doctor. <laughs> he said he say it was the Chicago Fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, but it's a, it's an amazingly gripping story, and it's, but it's mm-hmm. very dark at times. Um, yeah. And it's, like, reading the books is a very different experience than watching the miniseries, because in the books, like, people come and go, and they kind of die, and not a lot of time is spent on that, whereas... In the show, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the fact that all these people that Claudius loved or was friends with, they either all turn against him and then die, or they just die. Or they're killed mm-hmm. by someone, you know, it's like, and so he's just alone. He's just utterly and totally alone at the end. Yeah. Um, and he sort of, there's a conversation in the books about who was the last Roman, and in a way, Claudius was the last Roman, the last one who believed in sort of Roman virtue and Roman honor, and the mm-hmm. Republican and Republican virtues, and it's just it's just gone by that time. Yeah. Great series. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, do it. Oh my God. If you mm. haven't seen it, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Why are you listening to us? It's <laughs> so much. Oh yeah. It's really. And Jacoby as Claudius is just phenomenal. Mm. He has to play the age range from like, you know, 15 to 65. And you believe it every step of the way. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. And the makeup, they do a very good job on the makeup. Uh, for the time, obviously, it's kind of 70s. Yeah. So. Uh, but, yeah, fantastic. I think there was talk about maybe somebody else being cast as the old Claudius, but I think he obviously managed to successfully convince them in his audition that that wasn't required. Yeah, and he's, I mean, he's almost more believable of the old Claudius than he is of the young Claudius. Yeah. Which is funny because he was near <laughs> the young Claudius's age at the time. Yeah, and there's yeah, there's just tons of great stuff, and we completely gloss over Herod and what happens with Herod, but it's really unpleasant. And Herod essentially tries to rise mm-hmm. the rise all the Eastern nations against the Roman Empire, and then he dies by a horrible infestation, like his grandfather did, of maggots and things, and it's really unpleasant. It's it's very unpleasant. Yeah, it's tremendously unpleasant. And so that kind of <laughs> and Herod was planning to either use the idea of the Messiah in Jewish religion or believed himself to be the Messiah. Mm. And so there's actually a little discursive of about like these early Christians who are following following this guy Joseph Ben Joshua, or no, sorry, Joshua Ben Joseph, Joshua yeah. son of Joseph, who is, we know is Jesus mm-hmm. and sort of you know yeah. cult members of him. And so there's all that sort of percolating in the background of the second book as well. Because Graves wrote a few books, didn't he, on uh, sort of theology and mythology? Yes, yeah, he did. He was he was. You know, a classicist, I think, would be the best way to describe it. And so, like, this sort of venture into novel writing is 
novel only in the sense that he's, uh, you know, kind of attributing motivations that may or may not been there, but he doesn't, he doesn't bend the facts that much. He includes stories that may or may not be true, but he doesn't make up any of the stories. Um, not like HBO's Rome. Nothing like HBO's Rome or like the Tudors or any of those other sort of things. Like hmm. the miniseries does a bit of that, you know, by having the meeting between uh, Olivia and Martina and various other things. It does, yeah. it does cut things out of whole cloth, but by and large, it hews very closely to the books, which are mm-hmm. as near as can be historically accurate, which is, which is, you know, quite surprising. Um, Hmm. Claudius even has a great moment when he's talking to Livia near the end of her life once she's come to kind of tolerate him as the future emperor of Rome as she knows him to be hmm. and he says well, people die and then it's all that left are bits of lies that tell uh, people die and then all that's left is bits of paper that tell lies you know which is what history is it's bits of paper that tell lies yeah. And so that's all you have is bits of paper that tell lies <laughs> um, and it's just sort of I, I love that idea of distilling down stories in the past as bits of paper that tell lies mm. yeah and there's a, there's one line that I love and not one but there's one that really stuck out to me and Claudius the God near the end um, mm-hmm. where he's talking about going to the sword fights and we know that as a young man he was very upset by sword fighting and doesn't like blood and whatnot and just kind of became inured to it and it's when I was a lad, I couldn't bear the sight of bloodshed. I don't mind it at all now. I get so interested in the fighting. And I just thought that was, you know, a line that mm. worked well. And, but, that tells a story. Yeah, it really does on both levels. That by the end of his life, he'd gotten kind of so interested in the fighting that he kind of... And you as a reader get so interested in the fighting that you kind of miss the bloodshed. Mm. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it becomes crazy melodrama as opposed to, no, these were real people and they were really killed. And, you know, really see a 10-year-old get his head cut off and babies getting stabbed with swords and it's really dark stuff yeah. but oodles are fun mm. oh yeah definitely definitely M- most recommended if you haven't seen it get it hire it from your local video store get it from the <laughs> library buy a copy it's great yeah yeah and and if you're and if you're the kind of person who can read two two fairly lengthy novels between the two of them there are a thousand pages or so mm. that you know are written in a faux historical style um, yeah. about you know the ins and outs of ancient Rome and whatnot with long discursions about Parthian kings and things like that and ancient re- and religious practices and Etruscan and things if you can mm-hmm. hang with it then the books are well well worth it they really are phenomenal pieces mm-hmm. of literature yeah. well, certainly I managed, managed to get it about three quarters of the way through the first book I will finish it I, I've really enjoyed it the second book is I think much harder to read um, mm. because it starts off with a long section all about Herod that kind of gives the backstory that the first book doesn't have that they integrate very well in the miniseries they kind of by inserting him earlier in the story than he appears in the books um, but it's and, and because it's just him as emperor there's a lot there's a lot of detailing about various projects and building of aqueducts and the harbor at Ostia that is interesting but not quite as grip from a historical standpoint. From a historical it's standpoint, but, but it's dramatically, dramatically, maybe not so. I think, I think less so to some people. I think they were very wise when they did the thirteen-part miniseries to make the first ten mm. parts all the one book, and then the three parts of the second book condense everything down to the to essentially yeah. the Messalina affair and then the aftermath. Um, but it's uh, but they're both phenomenal. But yeah, mm. you know, I <laughs> you're gonna laugh. I uh, <laughs> I read these in college, you know, ten years ago or so back when I was actually reading the Tacitus and whatnot um, mm-hmm. and hadn't read them since. I've seen the miniseries quite a few times. I know it fairly well. Yeah. I read the two books this week. I reread them. Wow. That's some good. I reread them. Yeah. I reread them both this week. So it was a lot of cramming. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but they were... It you could Amy a run for her money on, on being a real bookworm. Definitely. Well, I try. And when they're enjoyable books, you kind of... They propel yourself, you know? Yeah. Like I, yeah. I was reading. I was finishing up Claudius the God last night, and I started at like six, and I looked up, and it was ten o'clock, and the book was done. You know, mm-hmm. sort of like just. I'm like, oh, I didn't eat dinner. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> this may be a stupid question, seeing as you've been kind of up to your neck in Claudius, but um, have you actually? Is there anything else that you have kind of been enjoying recently, kind of DVD or books wise? Or uh, if, yeah, but they're all going to sound really snooty, so just forgive me, probably. <laughs> um, 
One is, as, as if anyone follows me on Twitter knows, I'm currently with a group of people rereading The Odyssey. Yeah. Um, and so that's been giving me great pleasure because it's a wonderful book. And I'm reading a book about reading The Odyssey by an old professor of mine called Homeric Moments. Mm-hmm. Her name is Eva Brand. Not Eva Braun. Eva Brand. <laughs> B-R-A-N-N. And it's a brilliant book about reading The Odyssey and why. It's kind of fantastic. Um, so that, that's a lot of fun. And if people want to follow along, you've got a blog. Yeah, kind of. it's uh, it's Eric and his pointless blog dot com. It's a blog spot, <laughs> um, and you can you can probably you can probably actually I think at this point if you Google Odyssey Reading Club, almost certainly it'll come to there because I know at least some people have come to the blog who don't know who I am and haven't been following me on Twitter, who have come because they've been. There's someone who doesn't know who you are. Uh, I only have 500 followers. I am not this hero. I don't know who you think I am. <laughs> I don't know who you think I am. I am. I am the Claudius in the podcasting world, hanging back in the shadows and reading his books. Um, <laughs> so, I've been, so I've been enjoying doing that. Um, mm-hmm. And because it's Holy Week here in the states and other places mm-hmm. as well that celebrate the, the Western Orthodox or the Western uh, Roman Catholic Church, I use that schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, even though not super religious, in college we had to study uh, Bach's St. Matthew Passion, which is a piece he wrote okay. in the 1730s or so. Uh, that's essentially a setting of uh, the Passion as told by in the Gospel of St. Matthew to music along with mm-hmm. other text. And it's about three hours long, but it's just kind of like an annual tradition now that, you mm-hmm. know, Easter time means listening to the St. Matthew Passion and watching it. So I've been doing that, and that's just phenomenal. If you're not familiar with it, but like classical music generally, I would say go find mm-hmm. out the St. Matthew Passion, seek it out, and listen to it. That sounds interesting. It's quite good. It's quite, quite good. Mm-hmm. And what else? Oh, and I've been reading, uh, <clears throat> I've been, this one not quite as snooty sounding. I've been reading um, Who is the Doctor, which is a new retrospective, like, episode guide of the new series written by uh, two Canadians, uh, well, Two people who live in Canada, I should say. Uh, Graham mm-hmm. Burke and Robert Smith. Um, Robert Smith question mark? Because he has a question mark yes. in his name. <laughs> but the question mark is silent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really phenomenal. And uh, you should all go out and buy it if you have interested in, in the new series of Doctor Who. So that's the kind of stuff I've been doing. Oh, that and watching mm-hmm. some of the occasional opera here and there. Wow, you're a real culture vulture. <laughs> Uh, it's it, you just caught me at a wrong time. Like if you, if you talk to me like two weeks ago, I'd be like, I've been watching a lot of horror movies because I love those, <laughs> and you know, silly sitcoms and like Archer. If you know Archer, it's an animated sitcom on any American TV. You can probably get it on Netflix if you don't know it. Now. Archer is very funny. no, I don't don't know that. One. It is really over the top crazy. It's like a spy comedy, but it's animated, and everything is just really okay. very lewd and lascivious and very funny. Um, You're a man of Catholic taste. I try to be. I try to be. You know, there are good things everywhere. Why not enjoy them? Mm, yeah, definitely. And mine doesn't really sound quite as cool as yours. <laughs> you, should have, uh, you should have gone first. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to the audiobook of um, Sharda, the, the new oh. version. Yeah, is it Lala Ward reading it, isn't it? Yeah, with John Leeson. Oh, K9! Mm. It's very good. I, I'm about halfway through. I have I have yet to pick up. It's not released in the states yet, so I'm trying to be good. Right, it's actually released in the states, which I think is June, mm. July. Um, I'm waiting, and I, I'm I'm curious because I've seen the you know the animated version done with the eighth doctor yeah. that was done on the BBC website. I've seen that shot. Of. I have not mm-hmm. seen like the version that was put on VHS back in the day. That was kind of like Tom Baker narrating the portions that didn't get mm-hmm. filmed. Um, it's a weird, weird story. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking. That's my wife dying in the background. Well, I hope Amy's okay. <laughs> I know she. But yeah, I think Gareth Roberts does a really good job of kind of capturing that Douglas Adams essence. He's probably the funniest, I think, the consistently funniest of the writers that they've had for the new series of Doctor I think it's a good fit. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a very good fit. And um, apparently his novels, of which I have yet to read one, are for the Doctor Who range, are also very, very funny mm-hmm. and kind of very well capture that era, that, you know, fourth Doctor, second Romana, the Tom mm-hmm. Baker Lala Ward era, kind of, even though it's only yeah. a year and a half, that he apparently he captures that very well. So I'm looking forward to when I finally mm-hmm. get to read one of those for the book club, because I try not to read yeah. them of the Doctor Who range outside of the confines of the book club, because then I get spoiled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've had some real doozies, though, haven't you, in the, in the... What are we on now, the 15th? 
Uh, Episode? Uh, Put it on the spot. Uh, yeah, 15 was Crooked World. We just did Crooked World by mm. Steve Lyons. That was my favorite of the books. I gave it a perfect score. I hadn't done that before, and I'm standing by it no matter what anyone says. It's it's a completely bonkers, insane book, but it was just so amazingly profound and spoke so deeply mm. about very big things in a very funny and interesting and engaging way that I, just, mm. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't not give it a perfect score because there was nothing in the book that, I, that seemed off to me, you know. It does. I think as a listener to the show, it's, I get a great deal of enjoyment just hearing you two talk about these books, even if on the rare occasion you don't like them very much it's still very enjoyable to listen to oh, thank you thank you we we try to make it interesting we know we're doing something kind of bizarre which is do a book summation review podcast which is just like a weird idea when you think about it you know uh, but it works but we think it works we enjoy doing it i you know i don't even look at download figures i know sean does occasionally but i don't know the last time he has done so it's not you know, I think if there were like five people who were really into it, I think we'd still do it. Mm. Yeah. Like we never. As long as you're enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. As long as we're enjoying doing it. And that's what podcasting is always mm. about. You're enjoying doing it. Mm-hmm. So, and I enjoy reading the books. I enjoy talking about them with Sean. He's a lot of fun. And we get really great people to come on and read passages of the book. And we've had some really great readers and are going to have more in the future. And it's just, yeah, it's good times. Mm. I look forward to hearing more. Yes. There'll be one at the end of April on. Business Unusual by Gary Russell. It's a sixth Doctor novel that I haven't started yet because I've been reading I, Claudius. Sean's good friend. Uh, Gary Russell. Yeah, Sean's good friend, Gary Russell. Yes. <laughs> friend of the show, Gary Russell. Yeah. Friend of the show, yeah. Friend of the Doctor who looked up, <laughs> Gary Russell. Yeah, we we met him at Gallifrey. Um, mm-hmm. And other people had met him previously, but I, I don't think Sean had met him until this year's Gallifrey. Um, mm-hmm. And he's a he's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. Everyone's a lovely man at Gallifrey, though. That's how it works. Well, after after a few tequilas and <laughs> random other drinks, I guess. Yeah, we're going back into Caligula style debauchery again. Oh, not even close. We have we don't have the imagination <laughs> that he had. <laughs> but we certainly there certainly is the sort of comedy that one likes from sort of gatherings. Mm-hmm. There is the sort of fellowship feeling. Which is nice, yeah. So, if anyone out there wants to check out your podcast, where should they be looking? Uh, go to the Googles and type in Doctor Who Book Club. It will be mm-hmm. the first result, um, and then go and listen. You can also go to um, it's Doctor Who Book Club Podcast dot blogspot dot com. Um, mm-hmm. You're on Twitter as well. I'm on Twitter, it's uh, DWBC Podcast is the feed on Twitter. I personally mm-hmm. am SJC AUSTENITE. It's SJC Austinite is how you say that. Mm, that confuses a lot of people. It does. I picked it, you know, ages ago, and it's kind of it's a screen name I have all over the internet. Actually, it's like you, mm-hmm. you see that generally, it's me. Um, it comes from combining. Um, SJC, which was my college, St. John's College, mm. which I was in at the time when I first picked this green name. That's how long I've had it. And Austinite, meaning uh, a fan of Jane Austen. Yeah. And that's why it's Austin with an E as opposed to Austin with an I. People always think that I've misspelled being a resident of the city of Austin. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if I lived there, I think I'd know how no, to spell sure. it. Yeah. There are quite a few people who mm. live in Austin, actually. It's a great city, apparently. But uh, that's not me. I live outside of D.C. Yeah, mm-hmm. So you can find me there, and uh, like I said, the the blog where mainly I've been updating about the uh, Odyssey is at Eric and his pointless blog, Eric with a K, I should say, and his pointless blog dot blogspot dot com, and that's me. That's where you'll find me. Go check him out, or not, whatever. It's your call. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to let you up for God's sake. <laughs> It's been a real pleasure, Eric, and it's been uh, I'm really grateful for you to come on. Oh, it's... thank you so much. It's been great to come on and have a chance to kind of espouse on why these books are so great and why the miniseries is, in and of itself, even separate from the books, a great, really, really great achievement that needs to be seen. Mm. A lot to recommend. Very much. Nothing not to recommend, certainly. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, maybe we'll have you back sometime. I'd love that. Hello, I'm Rich Terring. I never listen to Nerdology <laughs> because I am way too cool. But carry on listening, nerds. So that's episode two. And just before I go, I want to say a quick hi to Lena and Lloyd, who both listen. Um, they got in touch via Twitter. 
And if you want to do the same, our Twitter account is at Nerdology UK. So until next time, thanks for listening. By the way, I listened to the latest uh, MHC last night. Which one? We've recorded so many recently. <laughs> uh, it was the one with the Horns of Nyman game. Oh, it was the first one of those, probably. Yeah, we, yeah. We've done one of those since, I think, and we've done, like, at least I've been part to two other, uh, two others of the, the cutaway cheats, the... Uh, <laughs> Eric's just been recording like mad. He's he's on a mission, I think. He is on a mission, and it's just sort of like, <laughs> he'll tell me, it's like, hey, you're free to record later. I'm like, sure. And so we'll just, <laughs> we'll just wrangle up like five people, and we'll just all get on Skype and talk utter nonsense. I think it was kind of harsh at the end. I thought you deserved to win. You know, I really did deserve to win. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Not that you're bitter in any Not way. Not at all. Although, if you no. listen to the next one when it gets released, you'll see that there's a... <laughs> <laughs> There's at least a couple references to Kyle having stolen my crown. <laughs> You're no longer king of the nerds. No, no. But I figure if I just hang in there long enough like Claudius, I will eventually win. You never know. I, I wouldn't quite put you in the Claudius <laughs> um, mode there, I think. Well, I, far, far, far too suave to be a Claudius. Yes, yes, yeah, you keep saying that, yeah. You don't see my head twitching like crazy right now. <laughs>